relevant to the theme as well. And it would also be great if we could have some discussion around next steps for this coalition. Um, as I said, this is a relaunch and um, the coalition has been a bit dormant for a while and we're certainly interested in moving forward, uh, particularly around the idea of kind of joint statements on free expression issues of relevance, of which there are many. Um, so anyway, without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Andrew. Um, Andrew will be discussing the challenges and opportunities for the democratization of free expression brought about by the internet and an assessment of the current climate. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Angela. That sounds like um, quite, a, quite a big brief. So I, I'm really going to make some headline remarks. I'm not intending to go into a lot of detail on any of the issues. I'm happy to come back in discussion. I think the best thing at forums like this is to give some headlines and then get a conversation going between us. And we're a small enough group to have a reasonable conversation. So the, the first thing I, I wanted to say is that the internet is a, a very disruptive medium um, and a very transformative medium. And that's true for free expression as it is for many other aspects of social life. And it's, a both, it's obviously a communication medium, like the print, broadcast, and so on. But it's also, I think of it as a network. And the networking aspect of the internet is extremely important because networks create new types of activity. If you think of the growth of the railways in the 19th century, they created new industries, new cities, and new sources of wealth. And that's exactly what the internet is doing today. And this summer, I was in the United States in uh, a town called Newport, and I went to a mansion built by the Vanderbilts in the 1890s at the cost then of $15 million, which is the equivalent of $400 million today, an astonishing amount of money for what's really a country cottage on the coast. And Vanderbilt was simply a railway magnate who owned a few railways in the northeast of America. But he was really the equivalent of the Mark Zuckerberg of his day, someone who made a vast amount of money from building and, and profiting from the development and the economic activity that flowed from this communication medium. Second thing I want to say is nobody really knows where the internet is going. Anyone who says they do is kidding themselves or kidding you. We are 25 years into the history of the medium. If you think back, John Norton, the professor in Britain, gives an example of somebody standing on a bridge in Mainz in Germany in 1480 interviewing passers-by and saying, what do you think of this man's Gutenberg's invention of the printing press? What effect do you think it would have on people? And at that stage, you would not have predicted the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the Thirty Years' War, or any of the other consequences that flowed from the invention of the printing press. So we are very, very early into this new communication medium. And none of us really know where it will go. And I would say the internet, and there's a famous principle, it's neither good nor is it bad, but nor is it neutral. The internet will do things to us for good and for bad. What those things are will be what human beings determine they are by the actions they take, how they use that technology, how they govern that technology, and how they are equipped to handle that technology. And unlike other communication mediums, a thing that's very different about the internet is it grew up as a series of purely voluntary arrangements and purely voluntary agreements bet between a set of academic researchers and engineers. But starting as what is essentially a set of private arrangements between people like us in a room, it's grown into a global commons that's run and managed by the private sector. It is nothing like any other communication medium that's developed in history. It's grown up in a very different way and unlike the global commons of land and water, the internet can get broader in that more people can join it, and it can get deeper in that it can get faster and it can do more things. So we have an expandable commons that's expanding all the time, that's of key public interest, run by the private sector through a series of purely voluntary agreements, not governed by rules as, or laws as we conventionally understand them. So it's really a sphere of what Vince Cerf has called permiss permissionless innovation. In other words, if you want to build something or do something, you can build it or do it. Policy making in the internet sphere is adaptive. In other words, it follows the events and the internet as it develops. It is not predictive. 
It does not seek to regulate things before they happen. So it's adaptive policy making versus predictive policy making. And the consequences of that are very, very interesting. If you take Africa, it took 37 years for radio, a nationally regulated medium, to reach 50 million people. It took television 12 years to reach 50 million people. It has taken the internet five years to reach 50 million people. The internet has gone really in a very short, between 1996 when there were about 250,000 users of the internet, it's gone to where we are today with 2.2 billion. And most people expect the bulk of the world's population to be online by 2020. There has never been a communication medium in the history of the world which has rolled out so fast to so many people in such a short period of time because it has evolved in that sphere where nobody's trying to control it and shape it and develop it. So we're dealing with something that is very, very different to traditional forms of communication. And for the freedom of expression world, for those of us who care about free speech and free speech values, I think the real significance is it's a change of the public form of communication from the traditional print and broadcast medium, which was a one-to-many medium. In other words, I said something on radio, you listen to it. I say something on a platform, you listen to it or you do your emails if you're not very interested. I put uh, on a television program, you watch it. I issue a newspaper, you read it. The information, the communication flows from this one source to many. With the internet, it's peer-to-peer. -peer. I talk to you, you talk to me. I create some content with some people at the back of the room. We share that content and somebody over on my right edits that content. Somebody in the middle retweets or resends that content. Somebody over there from Finland curates that content and decides to organize it in a folder with some other content that they feel are different. So there's an interactive exchange of, of, of information, which is very, very different to traditional models of communication. And what fundamentally we see is that those who've traditionally had authority over public communication I don't mean a conversation in a bathroom or a conversation in your house, but public communication, be they the censor in a bad situation or a publisher or editor in a very credible organization like the New York Times or, the, or, the, or, or any other newspaper, those sources of authority have lost that authority and control over content. You can no longer control content, whether you're controlling it for good reasons or for bad reasons which is why I say it has democratized freedom of expression and enabled us, all of us, to be publishers, editors, curators, writers, and, co and curators, creators of content. And a man called Thomas Pettit, uh, who's a university professor from Denmark, has gone so far to argue that, in fact, the, the internet is changing the whole way we communicate, taking us back to a pre-Gutenberg era, a pre an, in, uh, an era before that of the printing press, when all communication was conversational, rumor-based, and network-based. So in a medieval market, you would get information not from a newspaper or radio or television, but from conversation with your neighbors and the people you were buying things from. Thomas Pettit argues that that's now where the whole of communication is going, back to that conversational form and exchange of information. And he calls that the Gutenberg parenthesis, meaning that the Gutenberg era of the authoritative printed word, controlled and shaped by experts, is giving way to an era when the whole of the human community is beginning to return to a different world of communication. I, that's a very bold claim. I'll be very interested in discussing people's perceptions of that. But what we can say, that the first implication of this democratization of communication is it's having a devastating effect on the world's media. If you look at developed media markets where the internet has a significant penetration of 70 to 80 percent, commercial revenues are collapsing. In the United States in the last three years, commercial revenue to mainstream media has gone down 30 percent. In Europe, commercial revenue has gone down about 10 percent. That's a slightly lower penetration rate. But as the penetration rate of the internet goes up, 
commercial revenues for the media go down almost everywhere. And we're seeing really a collapse of the separation between the print industry, the broadcast industry, and the internet into an era when we're seeing content being created and organized on multiple platforms. So most sophisticated media organizations are moving to a point when you get your content online or you can download it into a print version or you can have it available in some broadcast version. But increasingly, I think we'll see newspapers moving where the dominant form of distribution is online and the print version became, becomes maybe something they do once a week or twice a week, but they certainly don't do daily newspapers. And in 10 or 15 years, I would expect that to be a pattern across the whole of the media industry. And we're seeing a tremendous change in the way that news is being managed, from being a, a regular news bulletin, authoritative, top of the hour at a particular time of night, which is when you got your news, to a rolling 24-hour news cycle, often using citizen journalists, I don't like the word, but ordinary people as providers of that content. We're seeing Twitter becoming a news platform in a way that no one would have imagined five years ago. So in my own country in Britain, if there are local elections at a very local level, the main media only cover them the next day when the results are all in because they don't have the journalist resources to cover every local count. If I go on Twitter, I get an endless stream of results coming through from the different people who are tweeting. So it's become a news medium that's actually more instant, more direct, and more contactable than the traditional news media, more flexible and more agile, and much more in tune with the 24-hour rolling news platforms we're becoming used to. So I think what we're seeing is a major shift in the traditional media environment, which is becoming, it's still very dominant, traditional media is still very dominant in most media markets. I totally accept that. For the next 15 or 20 years, we'll see a complete transformation of that media environment into something that is very, very different. And that's a very exciting thing, but also a very challenging thing because how do you pay for content? People have got used to not paying to access the internet. The personal data they provide is how the companies around the internet make money because if you don't pay for the internet, you yourselves are the product. But given that, how do you generate the income for investigative journalism, for generating content, and for particularly for authoritative, edited content which is reliable and can be, you can rely on with a degree of certainty, which you can't, frankly, if you look at Twitter or blogs or a lot of the other interactive medium. So an enormous big challenge there for free expression. Information will be ubiquitous, but it will be unstructured. It will half the time be misinformation as much as information. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with that kind of challenge uh, in the free expression world? where in the past we thought the media are the public guarantors of accountability of those in power. When that no longer exists as a traditional media, how do we hold that, how do we hold power accountable in that same way? Big set of challenges there. Another set of challenges is around the capacity of the internet, not just to do wonderful good things, give us lots of information, give us access to the world, but also provide our governments with a tremendous capacity to undertake new forms of surveillance of us, but also, because we love to give information and to get stuff free, we provide companies with vast amounts of information about our daily lives. And obviously, that information store held by companies then becomes a very temp tempting uh, mine for governments to access if they want to know what we're doing and what we're thinking. So there's a whole series of questions been thrown up which have been put into stark relief by the revelations around the NSA surveillance but actually, that's just one part of the picture. Every government in the world is surveilling its citizens and the citizens of other countries to the limits of their technical capacity. Everybody's doing it. It's been thrown into stark relief now, but that's laid down a real gauntlet to how the internet can remain a trusted and secure channel of communication and sharing if that's also happening throughout the world. Now, I think Sarah's going to be talking about some of those issues, so I won't say much more about that. I'll just say one thing. I think the solution or the response won't be, a, there won't be one response. There's no one plug you can switch on to fix this. There's going to have to be some technical solutions, some commercial solutions, and some policy and regulatory solutions. But beware of the quick fix and the obvious answer. 
So, for example, because there will always be unintended consequences with the Internet. So if you decide the solution to the NSA problem is for a government to say all the data on the citizen of Indonesia has to be held on Indonesian servers and Indonesian data banks, which is the solution that Brazil's gone down, you're going to make it very easy for the Indonesian government to plunder the data of its citizens held on those domestic servers. In a way, it might be more difficult for it to do if that information is held in other jurisdictions. So we need to think very carefully about how we design a policy and regulatory response because we could do stuff that could have a lot of unintended consequences. Second big challenge I would just flag up for discussion is the fact that this global public commons is run by a series of private companies. The analogy I'd say is you think you're walking down a street, legally you're not. You're actually walking down a shopping mall which is privately owned by a series of people trying to sell you things. And that private nature of the ownership of the infrastructure and the platforms means that when free speech is restricted, and it has to be restricted sometimes for the public interest in relation to certain criminal acts, incitement of violence or hatred, in relation to child pornography or certain kinds of, of, of other, other criminal acts, most of the decisions about that in a transnational environment are not made by domestic governments challengeable in the domestic courts, which is a protection we have in, at least in some parts of the world. It's made by private companies in response to requests from governments to take material down. And so you have a series, so the whole world which offline free expression, which many of us on this platform have campaigned campaign for years to provide, which is legal protections, legal limitations on how speech can be restricted, tests if you want to restrict speech, that it's necessary in a democratic society, governed by law, a proportionate restriction, all the things familiar to any lawyer here about how you can necessarily restrict speech, they, they're kind of dissolving in the internet because in a sense a company wants to make money. If you say to a company, this is bad content, take it down or there'll be consequences, Companies are risk adverse. They're not human rights defenders. They're not NGOs. They're not free speech advocates. They're people who just don't want trouble. So they're much more inclined just to take stuff down because they don't want the aggravation of arguing about it. So you've seen a whole series of instances around the world of that kind of private decision by a company to take down material in response to a government request, and we've lost the traditional legal protections and controls that we, were, that we used to have. So there's a big challenge there. How do we place the necessary restrictions on some kind of protected basis in a transnational environment? There's a big set of questions emerging there. So overall, I think, where are we in the state? You know, what's my general prognosis? The general prognosis, I think, is the internet to date has been a positive force in opening up a new world of information, a new world of expression, and a new range of possibilities, not just for free expression, but for social organization, for social justice, for a whole range of other causes. It's been good. We're now at a stage when we move, where, I, where we can call it a maturation or we can call it a major conflict. But we're clearly at a point with events of the last few months and the last few weeks where there's now a challenge to that essentially private, voluntary governance of the internet supervised by a small number of technical organizations organizing on a voluntary basis in the United States under contract to the US government where people are saying that model of governance is no longer enough. And that's not just coming from the Russians and the Chinese governments who traditionally have opposed it for political reasons. It's coming from the Brazils of this world who are saying this no longer protects human rights, no longer protects an open and secure environment. We need a new approach and we call it a call a summit next April to rethink the whole way the internet is governed. So we're going to be moving from probably from something that is undertaken through a series of private contracts with the US government into something else. The frightening thing for me is nobody knows what that something else is. Nobody's put ideas on the table about what that something else works, how it's accountable, who should run it, what are the issues are that should be run, what are the issues that should be left to adaptive policy making. They've simply lit in the blue touch paper, as we'd say in Britain, on a firework and stood back and waited for the firework to go off. 
And we actually gained a lot from that voluntary arrangement because it broadly evolved under the culture of a US First Amendment culture, where in a sense free speech was given a very high degree of protection. So if you think of Facebook, that started as a way of men at Harvard assessing how hot women were and circulating that information amongst themselves. If he tried to do that in most countries of the world, that application would have been banned because it would have been seen to be offensive to dignity, to respect, and so on. It wouldn't have been allowed to do it. But in fact, it became, many years later, the main social instrument of organizing the Tunisian and Egyptian revolutions. An application that started doing one thing became something, of, a, 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 something completely different because the internet's about adaptation and new utilization. We, we gained a lot as a world community from that kind of atmosphere of let, let anybody do anything and let, let's see where it goes and let's follow it rather than try and direct and control it. If we replace that regime with something else, we need to make sure, if we do what the Xinhua news agency said, which is de-Americanize the world of the internet, we need to make sure that the regime that replaces that has human rights values, has free expression, has openness, at its very core, in its founding principles, and its very fundamentals. Because if not, we'll exchange an unsatisfactory situation for something that could be truly catastrophic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments specifically about this presentation? At the back there. Thanks, Andrew. I enjoyed that. Um, I just wondered at the beginning you mentioned um, about uh, the waning revenues of big media that's currently in existence. And I just wondered if you thought, uh, if you had any thoughts about the impact of the recent acquisition of the Washington Post by Jeff Bezos and the new uh, initiative by the eBay founder, whether or not we might just replace large organizations that have a lot of cash at the moment with different looking large organizations that have a lot of cash in the future. I, th I think uh, that's an interesting you know, development. I mean, both of them. My concern about it is essentially that is philanthropy. You're not talking about a sustainable business model for generating news content. You're talking about rich people deciding to do things. Now, if you think back to the railway era and the, you know, the magnates of the 1890s, I, I compare the current round of internet billionaires to those US billionaires of the 1890s, the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Fords. They created giant philanthropic foundations, but those foundations follow their own agenda. They are private companies. They can put the money in. They can take the money out. They're, they're not existing within a sphere of public interest where you can guarantee they'll follow public policy goals. I think it's great they're doing it, and I hope they continue to do it. And I hope they recognize the vast money they've made from the internet creates a powerful social obligation on them to feed that money back into a new infrastructure for you know, creating and generating information and content. But it needs to be something in the end that's independent of their personal wealth or it will always be subject to the vicissitudes of their personal wealth and the whims of them as personal philanthropists. And so I think it's a good step, but I don't think it solves the fundamental problem of how you generate income to subsidize content over the next 40 to 50 years. Any other quick questions on that point? Okay, um, I don't know how quick. I just wanted to make a, re a remark on uh, what you said about the media um, that today c don't act anymore as a guarantor for the content. Um, so regarding um, this specific point, I think there is uh, an underlying claim that uh, it is not feasible for um, internet uh, operators today to um, look uh, into the merits of the materials uh, and the claims that are uh, associated with this material, given the uh, vast amount of information that is processed um, every day. Um, so in regard to that, um, maybe uh, it's informative uh, to, um, to uh, point out that in China, one of the um, greatest, uh, mass most massive system of uh, uh, censorship um, there are over 5,000 employees uh, involved uh, every day in the uh, reviewing o uh, over content. So it is not 
technically impossible. It is just a, an enormous waste of resources to uh, ha have that system in place. Um, and, that, and that's why I, I'm not suggesting that the fact that this is uh, feasible uh, should uh, lead us to uh, basically have uh, such system I in place. Uh, the, the problem is that um, we need uh, to have uh, intermediaries to make this kind of decisions uh, because they have the proximity with the content. Um, and uh, there is no, um, no legal standard regarding what uh, their decisions should, should go about, should be like. Uh, so um, what, I, what I want to just emphasize is that um, what we can have is a system whereby uh, automatically, um, as a first step, there is uh, some kind of filtering, some kind of uh, identification of uh, clearly objectionable uh, uh, content and uh, this should be complemented by uh, some kind of user involvement mechanism, uh, for example, uh, notice and takedown uh, procedures. And in this regard, it's interesting also to uh, point out the recent judgment by the uh, European Court of Human Rights in the Delphi case uh, versus Estonia, uh, where um, the state of Estonia was found liable of uh, um, breach of freedom of expression indeed, for having um, basically given immunity to uh, a blog uh, which allowed uh, comments by the users. Uh, some comments uh, in the particular case were found to be defamatory and uh, the fact that this uh, blog authorized uh, anonymous uh, comments um, basically was considered um, to be uh, shielded from, uh, from liability from the laws of Estonia, and this was considered by the court to be uh, a violation of freedom of expression itself because the intermediary was shielded from liability. So all this is to say um, this is one of the areas where I think uh, this dynamic coalition uh, should uh, put attention uh, because uh, the fact that the uh, state uh, essentially uh, abdicate their um, duty to uh, police freedom of expression violation and leave it to uh, intermediaries uh, creates you know, um, some problems uh, from the perspective of uh, individual rights. Yeah. yeah, I mean, absolutely agree. You've made a, raised a really important question and I think it's, it's very important to protect intermediaries. But I, I, think, I, mean, I think the internet is both a publishing medium and a communication medium. And I think the intermediary is part of that communication network. So for example, if I phone somebody up and I commission a crime, if I say, let's rob, let you and I phone you up and say, let's rob, a bank, let's rob a bank today, the telephone company doesn't get held liable because we've had that conversation online. That's, it, we don't regard the telephone company as liable because we've used their networks to commission a crime. I don't think you should treat the intermediary as liable because over its networks, those kinds of things happen. So. Okay, um, I think we might move on to the next speaker. If anyone has any questions, uh, we will have should have time at the end for them. Um, so please hold off until then. Um, our next speaker will be Shan Hong Hu, um, who will be speaking about UNESCO's work on uh, promoting freedom of expression on the internet. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Angela for coordinating and uh, helping us gather together today. You know that uh, in maybe uh, in 2006, when we had the first IGF in Athens, uh, UNESCO and uh, other partners, we created this dynamic coalition of free expression on internet. And I'm so happy to see this coalition still evolving till today and uh, also welcome to uh, everyone here. I wish we can have more uh, partners and uh, members in this coalition to work on this, this very important issue. And uh, as you can see that I'm, I'm, I've been working on the UNESCO's program on the Internet of Freedom. Uh, I want to just uh, 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 set a scene by stating why UNESCO is uh, interested, why we engage. Uh, 
we had a mandate, uh, uh, as stated in our uh, 1945 constitution, we are supposed to, our founding father supposed this organization to, uh, to promote a free flow of I ideas by word and image. Uh, that's why we, uh, we, we are mandated. Uh, we always say that we are the only UN agency with this mandate because the United Nations is a really great, big, very big family. There are many, many agencies. We have different uh, specialization and diff different area. And free expression is one of UNESCO's core mandates. This mandate we set it up even before the, un un the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, which clearly defined that uh, the freedom expression as to seek, receive, and impart information ideas through media re and regardless of frontiers, which now you can see is so envisionary, it exactly applies to the internet. With this uh, mandate and uh, in the internet area, we, we did uh, take an updated position that uh, free expression should not only apply to traditional media, but also to the internet, uh, to new digital media, uh, in even including the mobile now, which is really uh, per so pervasive everywhere. And uh, that is not uh, just a uh, uh, conceptual uh, change, but uh, it does imply very different, uh, very expanded uh, working area and activities. Uh, as uh, Andrew has just um, implied uh, that uh, it's we are really faced uh, with a more complex and a more expanded uh, legal regulatory uh, ecology and uh, with many new actors, uh, including internet uh, intermediaries, private sectors, now they are really owning the internet. Uh, they are de even developing all the new applications which, uh, in which handle the content. And uh, in the past uh, uh, years, we have been uh, present. That's why we have been, UNESCO has been actively present uh, in in the WISIS World Summit of Information Society. It's a UN-led initiative to bring all the governments together, discuss the challenges of uh, ICTs. Uh, now we, it has been involved into uh, annual uh, annual uh, forum of WISIS. And, and also Internet Governance Forum, which is also uh, one of the uh, outcome from uh, this WISIS process. And every year we are here to, uh, to debate on the free expression on Internet and uh, related issues. And uh, within the UN family, UNESCO has been chairing a United Nations group on the information society. It's called the ONGUS. We have an annual meeting every year. Uh, we coordinate uh, the different agencies within Uni United Nations to, to deal with the information society. Uh, uh, in, in, in April, in the WISIS forum in, in, I, in, in ITU, we have just uh, released the uh, August statement on post-2015 agenda, which we did uh, uh, highlight uh, the fundamental principle of free expression should be res res uh, respected. Uh, in the early this year, uh, February, in, in UNESCO, it's the first time that uh, UNESCO has been con has convened uh, uh, a 10 years after WISIS review meeting to, to look at uh, the outcome of the Information Society Summit. We have a dozen of uh, activities, events, sessions, workshops focused on the free expression, media development, certain journalists, uh, and, uh, privacy uh, at that uh, conference. Um, meanwhile, there have been so many global forums and events coming up, such as Stockholm Conference, a global conference on the Internet of Freedom in uh, Sweden, as a Freedom Online Coalition. It's a coalition of 27 uh, governments who have committed to promote uh, free expression on Internet, uh, including uh, uh, even including many developing countries in Africa, Asia, and the Arab states. Uh, Giganet, as you know, they are very active in this forum. Mm. And uh, within UNESCO, we have been organized the World Press Freedom Celebration uh, events every year on, on the 3rd of May. And uh, uh, in the past three years, we have 
I've been having a focus on uh, free speech on internet, the, the safety uh, on the internet, uh, safety of the bloggers. We, we do uh, mainstream this internet freedom into all our uh, programs. Today I'd like to elaborate more on our uh, publications and researchers because it's really a new area. We really have too many things to, to study, even as an organization. The first one uh, is the first edition of UNESCO series on Internet Freedom we, we, we conducted during 2009-2010, in which was eventually launched at ITF in Vilnius in 2010. It's the first uh, research to look at the uh, changing, expanded legal and regulatory framework shaping internet. Mm, uh, as you can see from this uh, graph, we have the freedom expression uh, at the center. You can see on internet, uh, there are uh, many other uh, initiatives, policy dimensions, which are impacting freedom expression, such as security, surveillance, where I've been talked such as the, the technical innovation, uh, such as the industry, I mean the company, uh, corporation policies, uh, even some user-centric policy, child protection, they are all having an uh, influence on this uh, uh, free expression, not, on, not to mention other digital rights, uh, privacy, uh, cultural diversity, they are really uh, correlated. Uh, that's uh, that's really draw a big picture on what uh, uh, what act what factors are in at stake. Uh, as a follow up to that uh, publication and research, uh, we have an identified a priority to study the privacy issue because in the recent years that uh, privacy personal data they became a, a very uh, important variant uh, in versus free expression. So their relation is quite uh, complex. Sometimes uh, they support each other. Sometimes they are competing to competing and uh, conflicting to each other. That's why we have been commissioning global partners uh, with our prestigious authors, Andrew, happily to be here and uh, to do this research. As you can see, it's a global mapping on the regulatory uh, landscape uh, on privacy and uh, how it relates to freedom expression. It's research proved, proved to be quite uh, uh, visionary as well, since uh, from the Snowden uh, exposure that uh, now these uh, UNESCO member states are so uh, worried about uh, the cyber uh, security, about the, this kind of mass uh, surveillance on internet and how it's impacting uh, not only the national security but also the civil individual rights. Uh, this publication we launched uh, last year in Baku. I think you were there. Um, uh, that's the first two editions of our research into internet freedom. Uh, now I want to speak about our ongoing projects. Mm, uh, it's really in the same vein. Now the first one uh, ongoing project uh, we are is focused on the safety of online media actors. Online media actors, it's a new term we are addressing these internet issues. Uh, uh, it came from the UN Human Rights Committee in its uh, new uh, concept on the journalism. Uh, nowadays, when we talk about the journalism, it's not just uh, those uh, licensed uh, professional full-time reporters, but all, uh, they, they do in, in include uh, the bloggers and uh, everyone. Uh, who engage in the uh, in publishing, in e expressing themselves uh, on the internet uh, and other platforms. Mm, because of this uh, change of the notion on journalism, our traditional program on uh, protecting the uh, journalists, uh, the safety of uh, journalists has been expanded to the cyberspace. And uh, you know, in the in on internet nowadays, there are so many websites, news websites, uh, bloggers. They are under attack, just as the their traditional counterpart encountered in the physical world. So this research is um, already commissioned, and will be finished uh, by March 2014. 
uh, we are actually organizing a workshop on protecting journalists and bloggers, online media actor in at this IGF. It will be on Thursday morning, nine o'clock in room five, and same room here. And uh, you will, uh, in, in that workshop, we, we have our researcher to present the initial outcome. And uh, we invited the other eye experts from uh, Latin America and also several speakers from Indonesia, media stakeholders to share their perspective with a strong uh, regional uh, aspect. So you are all welcome to that one. Another ongoing project is a case study on the role of internet uh, intermediaries, companies in pro protecting free expression. As we have all touched that uh, companies, now they are really the gatekeeper of content uh, in the internet. But uh, their role stays quite uh, tricky. Uh, sh should they play a role? Uh, to pro to free expression, I mean, they are companies. They are uh, profit driven. They have they have their own uh, agenda. They are mandate, and how, to what extent they should um, res uh, respect those international standards and the human rights? It's uh, there are already many debates on that. Now, this UNESCO research is trying to be more evidence based because we want to know what exactly those companies, they are dealing with the information, the uh, content-related requests uh, from third parties, including uh, states, including from the other individuals. We have identified five, uh, you know, there's so many internet intermediaries. We have identified five most important categories of the um, companies. We think they are more close to the content uh, and the data transaction. The first category is internet uh, search engine and the portals. Uh, second one is the social media networks. They are all uh, very uh, obvious. Third one is online media house, uh, including those user-generated content. Uh, nowadays, all the traditional media on the internet, uh, how they deal with the, common, the comments posted by the readers, for example. The third category is on the ISP, which is a new area for us, uh, that those uh, telecommunications, cable, mobile operators, how they deal with this. And uh, the fifth one is a data processing web hosting providers, also including the domain name uh, registration, which also a very new, uh, new actor, new uh, area in this, uh, in, in, yeah, in this subject. This research is, um, we have uh, launched a call for proposal two months ago. Uh, we have received uh, many, many uh, very quality proposals from uh, different country. Uh, we uh, will probably kick off uh, late this end of this year and uh, trying to um, launch it uh, next uh, IGF. We don't know where uh, still, but uh, we hope we can finish it uh, before that, before, before that. The last uh, important work I want to share with you is uh, a conceptual exploration on a new concept. Uh, we call it uh, internet universality. As we have also discussed, uh, uh, internet governance. We have been discussing that for so many years. And uh, in this IGF, you have also seen so many uh, workshop sessions dedicated on the uh, principles, uh, the values, what kind of norms, what sort of framework should uh, be applied to internet governance at a different level, at a global level, at a, um, regional and national levels. Mm, uh, Many uh, different stakeholders, they have different uh, perspectives, they have done different works in this, uh, uh, in this uh, norm normative uh, work. Uh, UNESCO, as an intergovernmental organization, we, th we, we need to take an uh, updated position on this. That's why we, uh, we, have, uh, we think that uh, in this, at this, this time point, uh, it's very important to have a kind of uh, umbrella, very meta concept uh, to be inclusive, to be neutral, to be accommodative to all stakeholders. Uh, initially, we identified the four uh, fundamental pillars which, uh, as, as which underpin internet governance. 
uh, cross-cutting uh, technical, social, political issues. The first pillar is the human rights based. With this uh, human rights based, it's uh, not only one right, but many rights. They are coexisting in an independent way. You cannot only uh, highlight one without respecting another one. And the second the pillar is, uh, uh, is uh, openness. Open, when I say openness, it's not uh, just about uh, the open technology, uh, but also about the uh, uh, market business. You know, the internet industry is uh, really polarized, very uh, much monopoly in it. We, we, we think there should be more opportunities for new actors to enter this uh, industry as we promote a diversity ownership of traditional media. I think that's uh, openness is uh, fundamental. And the third uh, pillar is uh, accessible, accessibility. <laughs> we use accessibility rather than universal access to, to highlight uh, the, now the priority, the, the focus should be uh, on not only on access to infrastructure, but also on the, ac on the quality of access, on the content, whether there be quality, uh, multilingual, local content enough on, in, in cyberspace, that might not be a case for many developing country, whether uh, uh, users are empowered, they have uh, uh, literacy, they have enough technical skills to deal with, to, to critically, uh, treat the information and the numerous data they, they, are, they are dealing every day. Mm, uh, we also have uh, the, the dimension on gender, on a marginalized uh, group in this uh, pillar. The first pillar is uh, talked about, uh, address, addresses the, the political governance issue that we are fully supporting the multi-stakeholder uh, participation as approved uh, Quite a uh, quite a useful approach. Uh, we can uh, we can address internet issues. Uh, this is a mapping, as I already stated, that this concept, the four pillars, they are impacting each other. If there are no, uh, even no matter how fast access you have, if you don't have the f uh, legal framework to protect the free expression as a human rights, that the, the, the access will be limited. If there are no, uh, no uh, participatory multi-stakeholder pa uh, engagement in the governance in, in one country, we don't believe this uh, internet will be well governed. We'll, we, we must miss something. Mm, so that's the, this new concept. So I think I will add last that uh, we're also having a, a workshop on the internet universality on Friday morning, also in this room at uh, nine o'clock. At that time, we will give a more detailed presentation on this new concept. You are welcome to give your input. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments specifically about this presentation? Good afternoon. My, mine is a question. How can we use Internet of Things to promote global governance to avoid transboundary regulation due to failure of nations in guaranteeing multilateral and bilateral agreements? Uh, can you can you clarify uh, your your questions about uh, multilateral uh, governance on the Internet? not really multilateral governance. How can we use Internet of Things to promote global governance? Okay. Because currently, you're saying a crime in cyber is not a crime in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody stays there and commits a crime. How do you regulate? You have companies operating on the Internet, and they have an operational base. Now, the laws in that country is not applicable in their operational yeah. base. That's that's an that's issue that uh, on internet. Uh, you know that uh, internet is really operating globally. The crime can be commit committed uh, transnationally uh, at every second. It's uh, it's very difficult uh, for for a nation, for a state, uh, for individual to to uh, to be protected with with this uh, sort of uh, challenges. Uh, yes, we are. 
we are thinking uh, in a way more, uh, you know, as th as that's why we need the uh, debates because there are really no quick solution, no one solution as Andrew said. That, uh, do it, uh, we also ask, uh, can, can there be an international court or can there be international uh, charter or treaty to address these things? But we feel very hesitant to, uh, to, to do it now because it's really to, it's beyond, uh, it's a complex complexity of these uh, issues is really beyond uh, uh, this approach, this simplistic uh, approach. We, uh, what sort of mechanism should be developed uh, uh, to protect uh, everybody's rights in this global online, on, online uh, scape uh, with versus the national uh, scope of the legislation? It's, uh, uh, we think that uh, for now we don't have the answer to that, but we believe with this uh, debate going on, that I think all the stakeholders, not only governments, we should find a solution. Any other quick questions or comments before we move on? No? Okay, then I would like to invite uh, Sarah Clark from Penn International um, to give her presentation. Uh, she'll be talking about uh, the impact of global surveillance on writers and journalists. First of all, thank you to Angela for putting together the panel. Um, I'm from Penn International, um, which is the world's leading association of, of writers. Um, and it's also one of the oldest human rights organizations in the world. Since 1921, we've been monitoring issues of censorship and surveillance. Um, and while much has changed, a surprising amount has actually stayed the same. Um, our global membership of 144 Penn centers um, are present in 104 countries around the world. So we have quite a, a strong grassroots presence um, of writers who um, have been feeding back with information about um, the impact of surveillance on their work and censorship on their work um, in the digital age. Um, our Writers in Prison Committee has been, um, it was established in 1960 and has been monitoring cases of, of writers who were persecuted um, for their work um, since then. And what I wanted to talk about today was um, two pieces of research that we're doing um, on the impact of surveillance on writers. Um, 
as you know, digital media has vastly expanded the capability of individuals and societies to express themselves online, um, both privately and publicly, to associate freedom freely and to exchange literature, information and ideas. At the same time, digital media has, have also increased the number of individuals who are vulnerable to persecution or reprisals for their writings, and they have provided governments and private entities new methods of accessing and monitoring individual information. Um, PEN works specifically with writers um, and poets, essayists, novelists. Um, we work with journalists as well. Um, However, our focus is, is, is usually on, on creative writers and we work, um, when it comes to journalists, we work very closely with uh, CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists and uh, Reporters Sans Frontier, RSF. Um, and the, the research that I'm going to talk about now is, is more specific um, in its focus on creative writers. Um, and in over the coming months, we're going to be using that information and, and working more closely with with groups such as CPJ and, and RSF to, to combine this, um, this data. So um, just to sort of give you an overview um, of this work, uh, since uh, 1991, PEN has maintained a case list of writers in prison um, and writers who are under threat. Um, that case list runs between 700 and 900 cases um, of writers who are directly persecuted for their writings. Um, and so since we've, we've been maintaining this list since 1991, um, and for the research for this report, we, we digitized those case lists um, to look at what the impact of, um, of digital media has been on the repression of, of writers and journalists. Um, so as you can see, uh, we have, we've looked at the case lists from 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2013 and you can see the enormous rise of, um, of digital repression. So um, just to sort of take you through um, this, this trend, um, in 2000, a mere 6% of our caseload was digital. Um, so this would be, you know, 6% of somewhere around 800 writers were being um, persecuted specifically for their writings online. Um, of that 6%, 50% of these violations um, took place in Africa. Um, interestingly, it was around the time of leading up to the assassination of Laurent Kabila, um, you saw increased raids on, on journalists, um, computers and offices, um, and uh, specifically uh, staff at L'Avenir and newspaper in Kinshasa had their offices raided and computers destroyed by government soldiers after receiving a tip off that the newspaper's uh, computers contained subversive emails. Um, in 2000, we also had our, our very first um, record of a digital death threat. Um, this took place in Mexico, where Jaime Aviles, then a journalist with the, the national daily La Jornada, received an email threat on October 21st, 2000, after writing an article which made allegations of corruption against the governor of the state of Tabasco. Um, the email death threat contained uh, words from his own emails, from Aviles' own emails, indicating that his work had been surveilled. So we can see even from, from 2000, um, surveillance of emails um, was, was, was taking place. Um, but it wasn't taking place with, with the sort of, um, the, the broadness with which it's happening now. Um, because you can see in, in, in other countries where the bulk of our, our caseload is coming from, um, Turkey, Iran, Myanmar, Cuba, Bangladesh, Peru, um, there were no records of digital surveillance taking place at that time in 2000. However, you can see that this quickly changed. So by 2004, 10% um, of our case list was, was um, for digital freedom offences. Um, China, Iran, Cuba, Vietnam, they all began to demonstrate their intolerance of free expression through digital media. Um, in 2004, in the Maldives, you had four internet writers who were arrested and sentenced for 10 to 15 years in prison for their writing um, on a website called Sand Hanu, a critical internet publication. Um, and then by 2008, you can see that this, this trend continued. Um, and this, this trend really mirrors the, the rise of, 
of uh, social media, so uh, Facebook, which was established in 2004, um, Twitter in 2007. Um, by 2008, China, Russia, Iran, and Vietnam um, were the worst offenders um, who were persecuting their, their writers and journalists um, uh, through surveillance um, and, and through their um, online monitoring. Um, in Vietnam, you had the poet, writer, and human rights defender uh, Ho Thi Bich Quang, was, um, who was arrested at an internet cafe um, for publishing her work on overseas websites. Um, and she was sentenced to two years in prison. Um, and so by 2013, by this year, of the 786 individuals on the case list, half of them, 49.2%, were persecuted directly because of their use of digital media. Um, and just for a little sort of breakdown of, 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 of how this is happening, so you can see that um, three quarters of, of those, um, those writers who were targeted were targeted for their use of websites and blogging platforms, um, and only 14.6% um, were targeted for using multiple platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Skype. Um, interestingly, it was a very, very, very small number um, of writers and journalists were targeted specifically for their use of Twitter or Facebook, and we were, we were surprised by that, but it's, 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 it's much more when those platforms are used um, together that, that these writers were targeted. Um, women uh, make up about 15.4% of, of our cases of writers at risk, both in digital and traditional case list. Um, and um, 24 so in terms of the charges that writers and bloggers are facing, um, some 23% of those writers and bloggers were never charged. Um, but we've also seen this really, really strong rise of um, the use of subver subversion as a, as a charge against writers and bloggers. Um, and this is, this is a global trend. And what's really interesting is that when we compare our, our cases of writers in prison um, for traditional um, media, um, some sort of 35 to 40 percent of those writers are charged with national security offences, whereas when it comes to digital media, subversion seems to be the main offence that people are charged with. Um, and obviously you can see that traditional media still comprises 50% of our caseload. So it hasn't become completely digital, but we obviously anticipate that it will, um, th that the, that offences uh, on digital media will, will continue and that that looks set to be one of the main places where, where that sort of repression um, will take place. Um, that's just a, a a diagram of, of the or of, of a breakdown of, of the platforms um, where of which uh, which writers were using when they were targeted. So you can see that actually websites um, remain um, really the highest um, the highest number of, of, of violations. Um, okay. um, so you can see in, in this year alone, well, 2012 to 2013, the last sort of 12 month period. Um, 15 writers were killed. They were mainly in uh, Latin America, in Mexico and Brazil, made up uh, seven of those writers who were killed uh, for their, their work in uh, online uh, media. Uh, 92 writers were detained in 20 countries uh, for digital media offences. Um, the countries with the highest total numbers of writers in prison are Turkey, Iran, Mexico, Vietnam and China. Um, and of the digital freedom violations, so that's for, for total, both traditional and digital, um, the highest number of digital freedom violations are Turkey, Vietnam, China, Iran, and Syria. And they make up half of all of our digital cases. Um, we currently have 51 writers on trial for use of digital media, and a growing number of those are in Europe um, and the Americas. Um, so in response to the growth of uh, digital freedom violations, Penn um, came up with a declaration on digital freedom in 2011, um, looking around the world at, at the different, uh, as, you, as I'm sure you know, there are many declarations um, uh, that, are, that are out there. We, we did a large sort of consultation on the specifics of digital freedom when it, as, as they apply to writers, um, and um, we over a two-year period, um, had a research team based in four continents um, who came up with a, 
a four a four point plan of of, of our declaration, um, and those principles uh, relate to targeting individuals, censorship, surveillance, and business and human rights. Um, and the areas of work that we have been doing, um, mainly in conjunction with other digital uh, freedom of expression groups, such as Article 19, CPJ, RSF, um, is con continuing to conduct research and advocacy on cases of writers and journalists who are subjected to, um, uh, who are, yeah, subjected to um, violations due to their their work um, on digital platforms. Um, We've also we continue to uh, submit reports to the to the UN Universal Periodic Review on specific countries um, and on the situation of digital freedom in those countries, um, and we've been um, developing a digital security um, program in conjunction with Tactical Technology Collective um, to create specific digital security for writers. Um, we've also been involved in two main legal actions, um, which I'll discuss now, and um, and, the fi and finally, we've, we've continued to research with writers um, the impact of surveillance and how it pertains to them. Um, so in terms of protesting surveillance, um, I'm just going to give sort of two, two examples of two of our, our, our pen centers. Um, the first is, is Pan American Center, who are based in New York, um, have been very active in the campaign for reader privacy. Um, and they're calling for new legislation requiring the government to show that those who's reading records it wishes to gather are actually suspected of, um, I'm sorry, of criminal activity, not reader activity. Um, um, we also have um, long been campaigning against Section um, 215 of the dangers that Section 215 posed to personal privacy of, of, the, of the Patriot Act. Um, and last year, um, along with uh, a large group of, of NGOs, um, PEM challenged this um, uh, in, in, in the Supreme Court case of Clapper versus a Amnesty International, where it was argued before the Supreme Court um, on whether um, PEM and its co-plaintiffs could pursue their lawsuit challenging um, the FISA Amendments Act. The 2008 law authorizing the NSA's massive surveillance program without being able to prove that their communications are being monitored under the top secret program. Now that that case was rejected by the Supreme Court last February, um, and because they said they um, the plaintiffs lacked standing because they could not definitively show that their staff and contacts had been monitored. And um, this was obviously pre Snowden. Um, and that case is now being um, led by the ACLU in, in, um, in, 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 in resubmitting the case. Um, so an, another sort of interesting um, situation that happened in terms of, of writers was um, at the end of, of last month in September, um, a German writer, Ilya uh, Trojanov, was just, he was denied permission to board a flight from Brazil to the US for a conference on German studies. Um, the airline personnel told him that she was required to inform the U.S. authorities of his presence due to border crossing security, and he was then refused entry on the flight and told he had to fly back to Germany. Um, and this was interesting because it was the second time that um, this German writer had been denied a visa to the United States. Um, he's the author of 20 books, including Attack on Freedom, a polemic on surveillance written in 2009, um, and he had recently written to um, Angela Merkel to um, for her to protest more openly um, US surveillance. Um, and absent any other explanation, it's not hard to read the refusal to allow this writer into the US as one of the most recent examples of a long line of cases where writers have been barred from visiting the US because they possess and express disfavored political positions and views. Um, in the UK, English Pen um, has taken um, a case along with uh, Big Brother Watch, the Open Rights Group, and the German internet activist Constance Kurtz. Um, they've taken the first um, case against the United Kingdom for um, for the um, the recent revelations of, of GCSQ's um, surveillance. Um, and the case arises from the recent disclosures of the NSA um, that the government routinely taps, stores, and sifts through vast amount of internet data. 
Um, and so the applicants are alleging that RIPA, which is the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, is inadequate to comply with the requirement under Article 8.2 of the European Convention on Human Rights that interferences with the right to privacy be in accordance with the law. And this is the first case that has come before the European Court concerning the interception of external communications under RIPA. So that's just been filed uh, this month. So it's definitely going to be one to watch. Um, another, another area of, of our work has been, um, I think as, as Andrew was really mentioning, all of, all of this, um, the issue of, of surveillance and, and of the internet in general, is, it's so new um, that the level of conceptualizing and, and really understanding the changes that we're, we're going through um, at such a quick pace, um, we've been very much sort of behind um, in terms of, of, of writers uh, who have been really, um, really examining um, what this all means. So um, another, another research project that, that Penn has been undertaking is to um, reach out to writers um, to have them respond to the latest um, revelations on surveillance. Um, and it's been, this is sort of some of the, the, the really interesting um, responses that we have been receiving um, over the last um, couple of months. So um, this was one of the, the interviews was with a, a screenwriter, Walter Bernstein, who was blacklisted and monitored during the McCarthy era. Um, and his, his response to the, the, the latest revelations has been one of very little surprise. Um, and he notes that we've always been a country where at the first sight of a foreign enemy, we go right into an abrogation of civil liberties. It used to be communism that called that. It was always socialism in one form or another, and now it's terrorism. Um, and he notes in the name of national security, great crimes are committed. Um, we've also been looking at sort of the historical perspective on surveillance. Um, and, and David Rosen and Aaron Santessa, who are uh, professors at Yale, um, in an interview with Penn recently, um, we're talking about their new book, which is The Watchman in Pieces, Surveillance Literature and Liberal Personhood. And, um, and they really sort of put this in the context, actually they go you know, right back sort of to, to the, the Renaissance and say, you know, now during certain periods of history, we see governments behaving in more or less the same way towards their citizens. Everyone's role is strictly defined and monitored in the hope that social stability will result. The idea is, if you surveil people closely, they will feel pressurized to behave certain ways. Um, and I'm just a little bit more on that. Um, Nadine Gordimer, the, the Nobel laureate from South Africa, her, her response was also very interesting. She said, you know, the NSA surveillance programs extend censorship as practiced in non-democratic countries from the print media to the means of communication most widely favored by followed by populations today the technological media, and this is the latest and most dangerous threat to freedom of expression. Um, she then goes on to talk about her own country, um, how acutely aware she is of the threat of this kind existing in South Africa today in the form of the proposed Protection of State Information Act, or the Secrecy Bill, which would include all forms of media. Um, and we also spoke with Kwame Anthony Appier, who's a um, professor of philosophy at Yale, um, and he also sort of put it, put it in this historical context that we, we, we seem to think of, of surveillance at the moment as something very new. And, you know, he, he goes back and he looks at um, Martin Luther King and he says, you know, great moral advances begin often as radical ideas, ideas that would lead those who have them to be subjected to violence. Serious thinking is done by writing and by exchanges of ideas with others. In a society that lived through the abuses of state power against Martin Luther King, we cannot think we will only be endangered, or endangered if we are wrong. I have sometimes thought myself, as I reflected on issues about the morality of terrorism and our responses to it, that I must censor myself in my most private writings because I cannot be sure that my writings will not be spied upon, misconstructed, or used against me. And it's these sort of quotes that are really interesting because Proving self-censorship is one of the most difficult things to do. And, and, and as we continue to explore the responses of writers, we're seeing, we're seeing writers um, writing, in, writing into us uh, in, in pen um, from all over the world talking about this increased um, self-censorship um, and, and their fear of not only, you know, publicly um, publishing what they're, what, 
you know, what they're, what they're thinking about at the time, but also in email form, um, and, a r and a real fear that their data is going to be stored and at a later time perhaps used against them. Um, and that's sort of uh, just to finish with, with Jane Kutsia, who, uh, another Nobel um, laureate. Um, and this is just in response, again, to the NSA revelations that those millions of Americans who today say they are happy for their communications to be intercepted in the name of the war on terrorism will one day eat their words. I don't for a moment believe that with this gold mine of data on their doorsteps, agencies of the US government, including the IRS, will not apply through open or secret channels for access to the private communications of certain targeted citizens and corporations. And nor do I believe for a moment that the data stored by the NSA is forever immune from hacking by outsiders. So these are all all the, the concerns of writers um, that we're seeing at the moment at Penn. Um, and then just sort of to finish, these are some of the uh, the, the future actions um, that we'll be taking. We'll be developing a more standardized method of tracking digital repression of writers and journalists. Um, we'll be creating a digital security app for writers um, with uh, tactical tech uh, who, who are uh, experts on digital security. And we will continue our research with writers on the issues of privacy, self-censorship, minority languages, and access to the internet and intellectual property. So, um, and just to finish, yeah, we, we'd, we'd really um, be very interested to work, we're always interested to work in, in collaboration with other um, civil society partners on, on any of these issues. And I'd be really interested to hear any of your thoughts. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, are there any questions or comments specifically for Sarah and Penn International? Over there. Thank you. My name is Matthias uh, Kleimer, principal. I work for the Austrian government, but I'm here especially on behalf of the Council of Europe. Mm -hmm. In the Council of Europe's work, we concentrate and focus very much on the um, problems that are the attacks on journalists. Uh, one of the big problems is uh, the impunity so that member states um, sometimes say, well, we do not, we do not uh, attack journalists, but when there is an attack by private ones, states do not react and do nothing. So the impunity problem is one of the, maybe in, in practice, uh, most focused ones there. How is it seen from your point of view as regards the writers? Is the same focus there as well? Yeah, um, the issue of impunity is, is enormous um, and we find that particularly so in Latin America. Um, so our, our research on, on attacks against uh, journalists and writers um, where the highest level of, of mortality um, and, and killings of, of writers has been happening in, in, um, in Latin America, mainly in Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Brazil. Um, and I think what we found in our, in our research there is that even though many of the states have excellent, um, they've, they've excellent like, laws in place, the implementation of those laws is, is really lacking. Um, and so impunity becomes the biggest, the biggest issue. Um, and in, in trying to, um, to challenge impunity, for example, this week Mexico is, is um, having its human rights um, record reviewed at the Universal Periodic Review. And, and that's one of the forums that we and our, our, um, our, our, our partners would, would use to press, um, press state, uh, states on the, um, that, that they address these issues of impunity and implement um, and supply, because um, you can have as many lovely laws as you like, but if you've no, if you've no one to implement them, uh, it's not going to work. Just a comment to that. Um, I work for IREX. I am uh, working on a project called the SAFE Initiative. And what we've done is the opposite a little bit, but in the same. We, um, we're trying to establish networks of solidarity in Latin America, uh, specifically for journalists, or the, um, I think it's been presented by the panel a, a little bit wider than just journalists. 
because especially in, in Central America, I think it's very important that journalists stand together against the threats that face them. And uh, it has been proven in the past that that has worked in the region and, and also in South America. So I think that's also something that, um, that can be considered. Thank you. Any other questions specifically for Ciro? No, well, in that case, I would like to open the floor generally um, to questions and comments on um, the, the issues that we've heard about and anything else relevant to freedom of expression on the internet, including the continuance of this coalition as well. So if anyone has any ideas about that, um, I'd be very interested to hear them. there yes um, didn't want to monopolize the ideas about the way forward but um, first of all um, I didn't introduce myself earlier um, my name is Nicola Zingales and I work for Tilburg University um, what what we heard are um, in these presentations is um, a generally a concern for um, being uh, censored on the web um, and in this respect, I think um, we need to ask ourselves how important is uh, the right to remain anonymous uh, in on the web. Um, so um, I mentioned that case of the European Court of Human Rights where um, the blog uh, was allowing anonymous uh, comments and the state of Estonia was found liable for allowing this to happen um, and giving immunity to the blog, essentially. Um, it did not uh, say that it's, it should not be, uh, it should not be allowed for users to uh, post anonymous comment, but it said that the intermediary should, in these situations, uh, promptly, uh, you know, sh it should adopt a certain level of caution and promptly delete comments which appear defamatory. Um, so this uh, is one challenge to the an anonymity on the internet. The other um, challenges from um, basically the NSA revelations. There have been a number of ISPs which started to um, offer uh, encrypted services uh, to their uh, users so as to um, essentially uh, prevent the um, spoofing by NSA over their communications. Um, however, some states have reacted to that by requiring um, through the legislation um, ISPs, national ISPs at least, to uh, give states the, the key to uh, de decrypt the content. So th there is a struggle there between um, the rights for users to remain anonymous and the desire from uh, states to uh, be always able to track them somehow. Um, also, the speaking still from a legal perspective, there has been a case in the uh, European uh, Court of Justice uh, which has stated that um, basically internet service providers are obliged to uh, disclose the identity of um, personal users. This was in the context of uh, copyright infringement uh, only if they operate um, in a commercial manner and not, uh, it did not say not, but it said that this was required only if there is a commercial uh, activity. Uh, so. This seems to suggest that there is, um, on the one hand, the desire for users to remain anonymous. Uh, on the other hand, when they engage in a, in a commercial activity, uh, that this anonymity mm, is defeated. Uh, so I was wondering just uh, your thoughts about the importance of anonymity and whether uh, you know, this coalition maybe should, should address it um, in the future. Um, and as a side from that, also uh, I should mention um, there is uh, uh, the tendency from social networks um, to uh, adopt a real name policy. So even pseudonymous names uh, are not going to be uh, uh, possible in the future, according at least to what uh, Mark Zuckerberg uh, says uh, regarding Facebook, for example. So uh, people will have to uh, have their real name uh, in their social network profiles. 
So I mean, back to you. Yeah, I think, um, <coughs> personally, I think anonymity is a very important part of the internet environment because of the threats and dangers that many people experience if they they go online. It obviously has consequences that all kinds of people can do all kinds of things that are bad in it. But I think the nature of the internet is it's uh, if you have an open environment, lots of good things come in the door, lots of bad things come in the door. And it's a question of how society manages and deals with that and whether they think on balance the good outweighs the bad. In my view, the good outweighs the bad and the requirement to eliminate anonymity tends to come or tend to come from governments that don't like things their citizens are doing for quite legitimate reasons. So for that reason, I see it as something that is an important part of the ecosystem that should be defended. Yeah, I agree with uh, what Andrew said, but just want to add that um, you know, in the VISIS forum in April, we also had a session uh, focused on the uh, right to anonymous. Uh, I think the discussion also show that uh, this uh, is not uh, one easy, easy issue to say. Uh, of course, generally, we, are all, we all support that uh, the every citizen, every user should, should have their right, full right to the to their personal data, to the information they have created. They should have their full control of, of it. And they should be informed if their personal identity or their personal information created will be transferred to, to be disclosed with a with legal, with a dual pr procedure. Another situation that uh, maybe th there's an uh, absence of such a legal procedure. Maybe this, uh, in many cases, the users and individuals, they w we, w we didn't know what happened to our ident identity information. And uh, that's why that I think in the recent um, UN uh, rapporteur uh, on free expression, Mr. Frank Lahui, in his report, uh, he pointed out that uh, now that in many countries that uh, there are not even a law, a uh, proper uh, updated law to deal with this, how this personal identity and information should be uh, treated legally with a seizure, uh, with a get a court uh, involved. So I think that's a really a field uh, that's a, a matter of uh, legal procedure to be respected in dealing with this. That we will need the work from both the governments, uh, from uh, from the uh, from the lawmaker, and also get the uh, intermediaries involved to have a, to have this in this process. And second, I want to pick on the safety issues just to share that. Um, uh, United Nations has adopted uh, a UN action plan on protecting uh, on safety of journalists and uh, an issue of impunity, uh, which means that uh, we are starting to uh, to do to really put this uh, into action in many countries. The first uh, four, uh, uh, four pilot countries we are looking at, including Pakistan, in, uh, Iraq, and uh, South Sudan that um, we really uh, look into work with governments because on the safety of, uh, of journalists, we, we need uh, the government to be more aware of it, to be, to, to be engaged, to, to facilitate the investigation to, uh, on its procedure. In the other hand, uh, we are also working to, to, to building up the capacity of the, of the media actors, uh, journalists, maybe writer, I mean writer is broader, than the UN action plan on because of the protein on journalists, but I think the same that uh, we need that uh, the uh, the journalists they are they should be aware of their safety issues. They should have some sort of uh, training and uh, toolkit to 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 use. Uh, we also trying there also another project to develop the mobile uh, applications that uh, whenever they had a problem they can just click and then it will be al alerted. So there are many new things we can do to help with these uh, safety issues. Um, I might, might just add something on that. Uh, firstly, from my kind of personal academic perspective, I think this issue of anonymity is very interesting and very topical. Um, this kind of concept of anonymity seems to fall in between 
freedom of expression on the one hand, right to privacy on the other, but does, isn't adequately covered by either of them um, in most legal frameworks. Um, and I think it's going to become a bigger and bigger issue with the Internet of Things kind of becoming bigger too. If everyone's wearing Google Glass all the time, then we can expect kind of some dystopia of, I hope not anyway, but some potential dystopia of constant surveillance online. Uh, well, there's no dif would be no difference between online and offline. Um, so I think this is a really big issue um, and one that does need to be conceptually sorted out as we're going forward on this. Um, from the kind of coalition perspective, um, given as I said, anonymity seems to fall in between free expression and privacy. Um, this is an issue that we would be very keen to work on with other interested stakeholders, potentially other dynamic coalitions um, in the internet governance context or NGOs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, any more questions or issues? We have one over here from the remote moderation or from yourself? Okay, from, from Carmen, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Carmen Turk and I am a PhD student in Estonia regarding uh, ISP liability issues. But right now I'm, I'm commenting back to, I'm sure I forgot your name, who made um, a comment regarding uh, Delphi versus Estonia case. Uh, just to avoid any doubt on, of my interest, um, in, in, in addition to being a PhD student, I'm an attorney who has been representing Delphi in European Court of Human Rights. So I just want to repair a few mistakes that has been uh, said right now. Uh, firstly, that it regards a, blo a blog. Then um, Delphi versus Estonia is not about a blog. It's about a news portal who's allowing comments from uh, third parties regarding its news stories. So I think this is a, uh, the, there's not a real big difference in, in legal kind of thinking. However, the it is a difference. And secondly, the Delphi case is not yet final. Uh, it, it, be it becomes final on 10th of January, so it's still time for referral to Grand Chamber of European Court of Human Rights. So there's no uh, reason really to despair at this moment yet. Um, however, also I wanted to remark on your very good comments on regarding uh, anonymity and, and real names policy. I agree with all the speakers that anonymity is something that we all must uh, must think about. and. Um, and regarding this real names policy, I think this has been already tried out in South Korea when they started a project on 2007 uh, uh, when they made, uh, when they enacted a law uh, stating that all news portals or other web websites whose uh, visitors exceeded 100,000 a month had to accept a real names policy. So the user had to go to some governmental page and ID itself. On 2012, finally, the matter went to uh, Constitutional Court of South Korea, and Constitutional Court said that, well, this law is uh, unlawful since it is a censorship me me measure, and also it doesn't fulfill uh, the purposes. Uh, why it said that was that there was quite a lot of research done because the law was enacted in order to uh, make the Internet less defamatory. So there wouldn't be so much libel, there wouldn't be so much offenses against other people. And the research is said that, well, the number of comments went down, for example, in all newspapers, uh, portals in uh, South Korea. However, the number of offensive comments uh, did not go down. Well, it went down by 0.2%. Well, this is not really something to talk about. So this is why the Constitutional Court said that, well, anonymity is more important and the censorship is not justified. So this is just, I think, one point of view and one actually tried out, uh, well, thing in the world where they actually tried to lose anonymity and they let it go again on 2012. This, these were just my comments. Thanks. Any responses to that or further comments or questions? No, well, in that case, I may actually close the meeting unless anyone else wants to make any more questions or comments. Um, I would like to thank all of the speakers, firstly, for their great presentations, and I hope you join me in a round of applause for them, please.
Um, I'd also like to just finish by saying kind of next steps for the coalition. Um, very happy to discuss this either this week in person, I'm around all week. Um, also, we do have web presence. We have a email list which has not really been used very much of late, but it is still active. If you want uh, to join, just let me know. I should have actually prepared a slide with all this information, so apologies that I didn't do that. Uh, we just set up a Twitter account as well, um, and we also have a blog. Um, so please get in touch um, to discuss kind of offline or online um, what is happening next with the coalition. Thank you.